Thanks, sir. Um, uh, tonight's presentation has uh, several sort of concurrent stories. Uh, they're all really big stories in terms of uh, what you could cover. Uh, so I'm trying to I try to do with a brief overview and not get in too deep uh, because it is a story about prefabricated homes. Uh, it's a story about suburban development. And then it's also a story uh, of uh, government's involvement with uh, with building homes. Uh, so I'll be touching on those three uh, subjects just... as we uh, go huh? through this presentation. Uh, the idea of a prefabricated home, if you wanted to find the roots of it, you go back all the way back to the 19th century. Uh, Andrew Jackson Downing, he was a New York landscape architect. And during the, the 19th century, he put out these design books, uh, pattern books, uh, that uh, people could uh, consult and build, uh, build their homes. It certainly isn't the, the prefab of what we experience today, but kind of the... Uh, the genesis of the idea of uh, looking at plans and picking your house and uh, eventually getting that house. Uh, and then we, uh, the uh, idea of uh, um, catalog homes uh, starting as early as 1906, uh, where uh, the Aladdin Company, Sears Roebuck, uh, Montgomery Ward, Gordon Van Tine, they put out these uh, catalog books where they came with, like, just like the pattern books came with blueprints and uh, you could order your home uh, through the catalog. Sears Roebuck was probably the most uh, well-known of uh, these catalog homes. Uh, between 1908 and 1940s, they offered 405 different houses that you could choose a wide variety of uh, styles and sizes. Uh, and eventually uh, 100,000 of them were made in that 1908 to 1940s uh, period. And uh, they were, they provided an affordable home. Uh, they arrived in uh, two rail cars. They arrived into your town by rail car. Uh, they also required a lot of uh, local help to get the building up. Uh, they, they needed somebody to do the wall sheathing, the roof sheathing, the paints, the stains, and especially the masonry work associated with the uh, uh, with the foundations and the uh, the chimneys. And the idea of a uh, of a suburban development uh, is often sort of associated with post-war, post-World War II, uh, but it does also have its roots back to the 19th century. Uh, the plan on the left there is from uh, Riverside, Illinois, and it's uh, done by a group called Olmsted Vox and Company. And uh, as uh, you can see, it's uh, it's almost looks like suburban developments today with the curvilinear streets uh, sort of devi deviating away from uh, the grid pattern that you find in the cities. And then on the right, uh, the another uh, thing that sort of led to the development of suburbia is uh, is streetcars and uh, the streetcar developments and the idea of commuting to work and uh, living on the outskirts of a city and then taking uh, the streetcar into the city to, to work. So, the, um, you know, we don't have anything of this magnitude in Norwich or you know, not uh, in terms of size, but just the idea of the development is uh, something we just uh, sort of need to draw our attention to a little bit and see how it comes forward to Jones Circle. Uh, during the uh, Great Depression, uh, Fred, Frederick, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, during the New Deal, had uh, his a whole slew of acronym programs, uh, one of them being the Federal Housing Administration, which was formed in 1934. Uh, and it, it laid out uh, requirements for new subdivisions. Uh, if you were going to get a loan and if you're going to build a house or you're going to build multiple houses, you had to follow these guidelines established by... Uh, by the federal government. And a lot of it had to uh, focus on like the location. Was it a, a healthy location? Uh, was the soil good? Was there good tree cover? Were you absent from ha hazards like uh, flood potential? Did you have access to public transportation? Did the uh, streets have uh, utilities and street improvements? Uh, things like sidewalks. 
I did the development, will development to sort of follow local plans and regulations. And uh, another thing that, and we'll also see this with Jones Circle, uh, they also really recommended deed restrictions that went along with the houses. And they also wanted to see that the developer who was building the subdivisions had a sound financial plan. Could they build the houses? Could they see the houses through the, the planning stage all the way through the development? And then uh, was, there, was there a vision that the, uh, the development would survive and be successful? A part of the Federal uh, Housing Administration, they put out lots of different booklets. Uh, and one of them was uh, Planning Neighborhoods for Small Houses, the book on your right. And it uh, not only did it lay out ideas for a good development in terms of having curving streets, cul-de-sacs, uh, uh, similar setbacks, uh, these things that create sort of a, uh, an inviting neighborhood. Uh, they also provided sort of plans for five different homes. And uh, these homes, uh, were pretty basic. Uh, they uh, they did have variety of materials, uh, but they did follow uh, a common pattern of being a one story, two bedroom, uh, really designed for the small family. And we're gonna see this, uh, this side gabled roof building form uh, with the central chimney there uh, repeated in Jones Circle. So and this is known as the minimal tradition, minimal traditional house. And uh, it's, a, it's a theme, an architectural style and theme that we'll see carried. This is from the 30s, and uh, we'll be talking about the 1960s, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, but you can see the genesis of uh, that style of house here back in the 30s during the, uh, during the Depression. But bringing ourselves up to uh, World War II, uh, long, not long before, but months before Pearl Harbor, uh, the United States government did pass the Selective Training and Service Act, uh, which began uh, bringing men into active military duty for what everyone saw as probably the uh, inevitable war. Uh, and they had did all these incoming troops, the training of troops, uh, the US government realized they just did not have the infrastructure to, uh, to support housing for these troops. And by this time in the 1940s, uh, there was, people had, their standards for living had risen a little bit. Uh, they, were getting, they were used to indoor plumbing, electricity, central heating. It wasn't just a luxury, it was a, uh, it was a basic. So the government really also realized they needed to provide that for their soldiers as well. Uh, the uh, Franklin Roosevelt stated, I can give assurance to the mothers and fathers of America that each and every one of their boys in training will be well housed. Uh, so this idea of this, uh, they built these houses called the 700 series building plans. And this really brings the idea of uh, prefabricated uh, houses to, to the forefront. Uh, quickly assembled uh, pieces were just put together uh, these are like larger barracks and hospitals, but this basic idea of the simple building form uh, with the gable roof is uh, one that's also going to carry through. Following the war, uh, there is uh, there is this after years of depression and then World War II, it's, there's this overall desire to return to normalcy. Let's uh, let's get back home and try to live a life after everything that we've uh, experienced. And such a part of that is uh, the desire to, or the need to have a home as this ad shows uh, the young couple showing the home that they want. And for what it's worth, that's a center chimney side gable house at the center entrance there. So even there in the ad, they're showing the idea of what the uh, typical American house at this time was uh, looking like. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he signs the GO, GI Bill in uh, June 22nd, 1944. Uh, the GI Bill has three main components, uh, educational support towards uh, returning soldiers so they can uh, attend school, unemployment benefits for them, and then loan guarantees. Uh, so soldiers had easier access to uh, purchase homes, businesses, farms, uh, and just made it easier for them to get credit. We'll see that that's a, a program that's also going to 
really simulate stimulate uh, post-war suburban growth and uh, these prefabricated home companies. Uh, so the real, like I said, it was it was uh, it was very hard to get a, a house prior to the GI Bill. A soldier or anyone would have to put down 58% of the home's value to secure mortgage, uh, which made it very difficult to uh, to get a house. Uh, so through the GI Bill, it was very easy for the soldiers to uh, get mortgages, and uh, developers could offer credit, and sometimes uh, these families could get into a house without putting a down payment at all. Perhaps the most famous of, uh, of the post-war developments is Levitt Town in Pennsylvania, made by uh, William J. J. Levitt for his company, Levitt and Sons. Uh, it was built for returning veterans and their families. Uh, the homes were about $7,900 and uh, 17,000 units were sold, uh, providing homes for 84,000 people. And uh, they also had swimming pools, public parks, recreational, facilities there, but the homes were very, very basic uh, cookie cutter homes. And uh, as you can see, sort of these basic forms that we have been looking at, uh, the side gabled house uh, with uh, one story. And uh, the, the, like I said before, it was just the soldiers were just glad to be alive, to be secure, to be with their families. So these houses were everything they asked for. Uh, William Levitt got on the cover of Time uh, in June of 1950. Uh, the, at the time, no pun intended, Time magazine wrote, uh, every, every 100 feet, trucks stopped and dumped identical bundles of lumber, pipes, bricks, shingles, and copper tubing. Near the bundles, giant machines with an endless chain of buckets ate into the earth, taking just 13 minutes to dig a narrow four-foot trench around a 25 by 32 foot rectangle. Then came more trucks loaded with cement and laid a four inch foundation for a house. And uh, it was sort of like an assembly line. Uh, they would go for the one site and then move down to the next site. And uh, after they laid the foundation, then after it was settled, then uh, another sort of group of assembly workers worked their way down through the uh, houses. And uh, they could uh, quickly put together a house in sort of this assembly line and so much of this idea of the prefabricated house does have its roots in in the industrialization of america and uh, uh, say like ford motor cars and uh, this idea of economies of scale uh, we can do things uh, have uniform standard sizes uh, we can do things quicker and uh, uh, cheaper uh, less expensive the book that came out uh, also, the Community Builders Handbook uh, also focused on how a, uh, a development should look. Uh, the idea of having curved streets uh, allowed for greater privacy for the homeowners uh, was visually appealing. Uh, there was also other things like uh, reduced cost of utilities and road construction. There were less roads uh, when, you did, uh, when you did developments in these curved fashions. And Another thing that seemed seen as a big danger at the time was the uh, four-way intersections. So they're trying to do away with those as well, even though, as I see, there's one in this picture right here. So not a good example. The prefabricated homes really uh, start to, to gain uh, traction after World War II, seeing that uh, how easy it was to make these homes for the soldiers. Uh, there was a lot of companies that propped up. One was Foster Gunnison. Uh, in this, uh, the owner or the guy who started Foster Gunnison came from the General Electric Company who made their own company called Houses Inc. who really looked into, uh, did a lot of research on prefabricated homes. And then uh, Owen D. Young, the guy who started Foster Gunnison left General Electric, Electric and started his own company in New Albany, Indiana. And these were some of the early uh, prefabricated homes. And then national homes, James and George Price uh, were the, to the brothers who started it. James Price actually worked for Foster Gunnison and uh, 
left Foster Gunnison and started his own company, National Homes in Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, they started in 1940, sort of had a slow start uh, from 1941 through 1945. Uh, they built uh, 7,500 single family homes. But after the war, things really took off. Uh, and by 1956, they had built 100,000 homes. And then by 1963, 250,000 homes. Now I'm just going to do a little tour of uh, what it looked in, like inside of uh, inside of the prefab plants in Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, to here they are cutting wood for uh, for the houses. Uh, here they are applying the sheetrock to to the wood panels, so you could just put up the whole wall and it already has sheetrock on it. Uh, making doors, pre-finished doors. Uh, all the work was done in the factory in terms of uh, paints and finishes, et cetera. So you didn't have to worry about that once it was delivered. And then some other pictures showing uh, work on, uh, on the interior walls, exterior walls, work on doors, working on the framing. A uh, important part of uh, National Homes is uh, building building buildings uh, was these stress skin plywood panels and what it was was uh, these two sheets of plywood applied to wood girders uh, not using nails but glued together and by doing this it created a much stronger uh, piece of wood where the plywood was just not dead weight it was actually it was able to be a structural member and uh, it made for uh, it could uh, withhold stress very well. It also, you could put it, it created a wall cavity, which was good for insulation and also interior wiring. Uh, just showing, uh, these aren't necessarily national. The one on the right is national homes and the one in the center. Uh, the one on the left is just another uh, type of prefabricated home, but you can see just from these pictures uh, what, we're, uh, what we're dealing with in terms of, uh, of them being erected. So now prefabricated homes uh, actually sort of faced an uphill battle immediately after the world, after World War II. Uh, there was actually the association with the temporary housing and people thought that uh, the, the prefabs weren't substantial enough, not strong enough, not permanent, lacked individuality. individuality. Uh, so uh, National Homes did face a, uh, a task of uh, how are we going to sell this uh, our product to the people, and uh, National Homes did had a very aggressive uh, uh, ad campaign, and as this ad shows, they're saying a real home for real living, really stressing this isn't some temporary structure that's going to fall down. This is a permanent home that's like any other home. And they also, what made National Homes very successful too, is that they had, uh, they developed local representatives who were uh, dealers for National Homes. And so, uh, as we'll see in the case of uh, the Norwich area, there was a single uh, builder, Fred Brown, who was the representative for National Homes. And National Homes targeted a lot of builders saying, we are the answers to all your problems. Uh, if you're a small company, we can provide the materials. Uh, we're gonna provide materials that are easy to assemble. We have a brand name recognition. And uh, we can, since we're doing things in bulk, we can get things to you for, uh, for cheaper. So it was really it, a lot of, it was really appealing to the local builders because they had this, uh, this source for, for uh, clients really. And then back to the Federal Housing Administration, uh, the National Homes did target the banks as well. Uh, they really tried to promote their company as being financially sound and that their product was, uh, was very structurally strong as well and trying just to show the banks that uh, you can support a National Homes product. Uh, it's okay to, to give those loans and those mortgages because our product is uh, one that's here to stay. 
Uh, so coming out of the catalog, 12, uh, 12 good reasons for buying a national home. Uh, you have choices of styles, as we'll see that uh, many of these styles were done by famous architects. A uh, spacious living room with well lit uh, storage, big ceiling high closets, uh, insulation, a big kitchen with uh, space for family meals, a uh, Youngstown kitchen, which was a popular kitchen style. And then uh, for mica work on the cabinets, uh, forced warm hair warm air heating, uh, weather strip doors, double hung windows, uh, well decorated and brand name materials uh, throughout. We'll see in a little bit all the, uh, all the different sort of companies that were associated with national homes. And then uh, it came with a, a, a warranty, one year warranty. Uh, the, there was a uh, definitely a target when we're going into post-war America and uh, the idea of the nuclear family and the man working at home and the mother staying at, uh, at home, working not at home and then the mother staying at home. Uh, the, the National Homes ad campaign was definitely uh, focused on uh, the women of the house as well, as you can see in these three ads. And uh, as I said before, there was they came with the Youngstown kitchens uh, made by the Mullins Manufacturing Company in Warren, Ohio. Uh, they were not wood. Sometimes they were steel or porcelain. Uh, they had all the up and coming new uh, gadgets. Um, and they uh, it was just uh, it was promoted as the, the, the dream kitchen. And I'm gonna try this for a little humor interlude. This is the Youngstown Kitchen Singers. You can sing along. Brian, I'm not sure we can get the volume. They can't hear it? Yeah, no. Oh, okay. Well, as you can see by the bubble, they uh, they like to promote their kitchens. But I'll move on. And now we are with the catalog. So things have not changed uh, so much since uh, the, the Sears Roebuck catalog of the 20s. Uh, National Homes put out a catalog and uh, you could go through the catalog and, uh, and pick your home just like you could in 1920. As you can see, uh, there's lots of different, uh, you, what you could do is you could choose the floor plan that you desired and then just match it with the style of home you desired as well. And then once even with the home itself, the exterior features, you could flip the design, uh, you could uh, change windows around. Uh, so it's, uh, you have lots of different options. Uh, and in, not all of them had basements, as you can see back here on the, in the blue section, uh, they show some closets and then they show an option where you could put access to the basement. So the basements were a uh, something you could also choose, uh, something that we see in uh, New England and these Norwich houses. And then lots of great interior features. Uh, the, uh, the large spacious uh, living room with great windows, uh, brick and wood panel walls, uh, kitchen islands with the uh, built-ins, uh, floor to ceiling closets. Uh, they had dividers. They, the bottom left one was actually a divider. So you could have like a large room where you could just close a room off. So you could create two rooms. Uh, so lots of options for, uh, for the interior as well as the exterior. Uh, on the left, you can, they got it pretty much down to three, three steps. Choose the floor plan, choose the exterior design, and then choose your exterior finish. Uh, in the center, you could add carports and garages. 
And as the, on the right, just suggests that the, all, one of the fears were that all the houses were gonna look the same and be exactly the same. And the national homes really stress this idea that you could individualize your home so it could stand out and not just be a cookie cutter home. And they also, it's like all the companies that were associated with national homes and the products were used was like a who's who of uh, 1960s industrialism, uh, things like Formica, Gypsum, uh, Owings Corning fiberglass, uh, fir plywood, DuPont, Alcoa aluminum, masonite panels. So you, all the newest technology was uh, incorporated in these, uh, in these, uh, these homes. And then they started to, National Homes started to, they brought on four different architects to uh, help design their homes. Uh, they were uh, Charles Goodman of Washington, D.C., Royal Mary Wills of uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Emil Schmidlin of East Orange, New Jersey, and Reginald Roberts of San Antonio, Texas. And they all sort of uh, provided their own design style for the catalog and their own influence. Uh, Wills uh, from the Boston area uh, had his own company, own architecture office in Beacon Street in Boston, and he was well known for the Cape design. And uh, he's, the Cape is uh, he was known for the center chimney, the eave side entry, the center entrance, uh, the, atta the attached garage, and that's uh, something that we see in uh, in Jones Circle. And then Emil Schmidlin, uh, he uh, he used the colonial style. Uh, so they call Will's uh, sort of the Cape, the Cape Cod style uh, in terms of the options that you uh, can get for national homes. And uh, Schmidlin, he covered a lot of ground. Uh, he had a, he did a colonial, he did some contemporary, he worked with some ranches. Uh, some things that he did that he was well known for, uh, he built the Case Setter House in Orange, New Jersey in 1949. It was a, a house that was promoted by House Beautiful magazine as being the, uh, the, dream, the perfect house. And then he also made the Formica House, which is on the left, bottom left, and then on the right, which was at the New York World's Fair in 1964 uh, with Formica on all of the uh, exterior walls. And you can see the Schmidlin plan and the Wills plan. You can see uh, how they're represented in uh, in Jones Circle development. Uh, and once again, you don't. It's hard to uh, this work has been hard to sort of find the exact model that came out of the catalog. And I think that just reflects the idea that uh, uh, the the owners could change plans. The builder could uh, offer different suggestions. So it wasn't, as I was saying before, like it, you could really individ, individualize the home. So there is uh, actually this difficult difficulty now sort of going back and saying, okay, that it is this model. It's a fun challenge though. Uh, Charles Goodman, uh, he, was, uh, he was a little more on the modernist side and uh, he, he hated the colonial revival style in general. Uh, he said uh, he wasn't really into reproduction styles uh, and he was much more into promoting uh, sort of what was known as the modern art, like mid-century modern that was popular in this time. Uh, we don't see any of his real work in Joe's circle. Oh, we see one, I'm sorry. We, I mean, this is the one, the one house that uh, sort of stands out amongst the Jones circle houses. Uh, it's uh, not a colonial, it has uh, more of the wide eaves. And uh, the picture up top is from 1960 and the one below is from uh, recently. And it's uh, a little bit closer to the, uh, the Goodman style of architecture versus uh, the Barry Wills or the Schmidlin style. And then Reginald Roberts, who is from San Antonio, Texas, uh, he did more of a modernist style and um, sort of a Spanish colonial style. We don't you know, don't see his uh, work up here up north at that much or at all, not in the case of Jones Circle. Uh, so if it, I feel like a lot of the Jones Circle houses are a combination of uh, 
of both Will's and Schwindlin's uh, influences, uh, and also going back to sort of the, the minimal traditional styles that we saw with the FHA programs. But the Schmidlin did use uh, a lot of the hipped roof, as you can see on the right. And there's a, a good example of a hipped roof in, uh, in Joan's circle. And here we are now, we're uh, in Joan's circle. And uh, during leading up to this development, it was uh, owned by several different families over the years, the Sargent family, the Ainsworth family, and the Hazen family. And then Richard Putnam uh, and his wife Viola, Viola were the uh, ones that really put the land, started to put the, together the idea of developing, uh, developing this land. Uh, Putnam was the former president and director of Putnam Drug Company, a family run business in Hanover. So he's from right across the river. Uh, he was very active in Hanover affairs. Uh, worked, he would, worked with the Hanover Development Corporation, the Rotary Club. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Planning Board, and uh, was uh, very active in Hanover and in Norwich. Uh, Viola was active in Norwich. Uh, she went to the School of Cosmetology in Concord and owned and operated the beauty shop in Norwich and Hanover. Uh, she was active in Norwich Congregational Tur Church, where she taught Sunday school, and she was also a member of the Church of Christ at Dartmouth. And uh, they were the first ones to subdivide the land. And you can see it's tough to uh, to really see the image on the left is a, a subdivision plan filed with the town of Norwich. It's in the uh, in the town today, and you can see uh, the access to to the to the development. But this one is interesting because it changed. Uh, if you can see, the access road to the development actually came off of Main, Main Street versus Elm Street. So uh, it went through different incarnations. Uh, and this, uh, this submitted plan is also has a cul-de-sac instead of the, the circle that you see today. Uh, the access road there was called Dr. Jones Lane. I'll talk about uh, uh, Dr. Jones as well. Uh, and, the, uh, and I mentioned before that uh, the houses a part of uh, the FHA program was uh, developments should have deed restrictions and the Putnams did put some deed restrictions on the, on the development. Uh, and these uh, conditions ensured that the neighborhood would appear as unified and cohesive and, and the buildings had to be a single detached dwelling house with or without a private garage. A private residence was the only accepted use the house could not be erected for less than $10,000 and had to have a double pitch roof with a minimum drop of six inches every 12 feet. And then the setback had to be greater than 50 feet from the center line of the street and all sewage was to be underground. So there was this effort to, uh, to have a, uh, a unified neighborhood. And it's named Jones for the fate, uh, probably gonna, pronounced this wrong, Lefebvre and Eva Jones, uh, because they owned the property in the 1940s, so the property up there in the top right. And uh, they were married in 1913. Uh, he was ed educated at that third academy in the University of Vermont Medi Medical School. And uh, he was a classic country doctor who uh, traveled by horse and buggy and then a Model T to, to serve his pa patients. And uh, he was Norwich's town officer for 37 years from 1907 until 1944. And they lived on a Greek revival house on Main Street. Uh, Eva Jones taught in the schools in Norwich. Uh, she was active in the Congregational Church and the Norwich Women's Club and uh, was involved with uh, the Norwich Library Association. So, the, and the Putnams, who I was talking about before, eventually sold the house to Charles, I mean, the development to Charles, or the, the, the land, it wasn't even a development yet, the, the land to Charles and Helen McKenna in 1953. Uh, Charles McKenna worked for the state of Vermont for the Unemployment Compensation Commission. He was an investigator for them, and he was also a developer. In 1961, he built the Norwich Post Office. 
And uh, conveniently enough, his wife was the Norwich Postmaster, so she got to enjoy uh, the fruits of his uh, designs. Uh, they developed Jones Circle, and they also developed what is known as McKenna Road. And the McKenna's had Jones Circle development surveyed, and then they sold some. They sold some of the lots to uh, some individuals, but they sold most of them to Fred Brown Jr. of uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire. That's the picture of his offices in Lebanon. Uh, Fred Jones uh, on the right in both pictures, I believe. Oh no, he's on the left in the younger picture, and on the right in the second picture. Uh, he was born in Fairley, Vermont son of Fred and Marion Brown. Uh, his dad was a farmer, a blacksmith, timber harvester. And uh, Fred Brown attended Bradford Academy uh, where he learned, uh, learned carpentry. And after graduating in 1938, he got right into the building trade. And uh, most of these ads here are from 1950s. Uh, but by 1955, he had about 15 carpenters uh, working for him. And he was building about 12 to 15 homes a year. And uh, so he had a very successful uh, 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 business. He also built uh, the Lakeview Hotel on Muscoma Lake and uh, the Hanover Pre-Nursery School. Uh, he renovated Hanover's Tavern Block. And then he did an addition to the Farrelly School as well. So he did not only homes, uh, but he also did institutions and he also not only did national homes prefab homes but he built homes uh, on, on his own as well uh, so using national homes as because national homes was uh, was attracting these design builders to get on board with them and uh, what they could do is provide things like ads uh, so these were just sort of templates. And then as you can see down at the bottom, Fred Brown really just had to fill in his name in the bottom and then fill in the location, Jones Parkway, uh, in the middle there. And uh, they just provided everything you needed uh, to, to, to get this program going and make the, the buying and selling of a home an easy process. As you can see in both of these, uh, Fred Brown at the time had the idea of both the designs of Schmidlin and uh, Wills. Uh, the top, the one on the left, it's hard to read, but it does say that's designed by Emil Schmidlin. And on the one on the right does say designed by Royal Barry Wills. Uh, so he definitely wanted to build homes designed by those two architects. And uh, you can see from the middle there, he does have he had open houses to come look at uh, at these uh, these new houses. Uh, just as a side uh, note, his son continued to be a carpenter in uh, in the Norwich area. His uh, truck actually had on the bottom right actually has uh, honor to his father. Uh, he advertised his own business, and then he all paid also paid respect to his father. Uh, on the side of his uh, his work truck, and uh, the top right tool bag actually belonged to his father. And so we, by 1959, as you can see on the uh, the map there, well, we're not quite fully developed. We have five houses, and uh, and then 1962, which is the aerial. Uh, we have uh, a fully developed uh, Jones uh, Jones Circle. Uh, it is uh, it is a form of a cluster subdivision, uh, not you know, which uh, was promoted at this time. Uh, once again, a focus on curvilinear streets. Uh, you it maximized uh, uh, the building lot. You put the houses closer to the road, and then you had more room in the back. Uh, in most cases, cluster housing also, by doing it this way, you had more open space, uh, uh, available common space. I think in Jones Circle, I think there's a lot of uh, just being restricted by the size of the lot itself. And I think that's really why the, the circular pattern was utilized because it maximized uh, the, the amount of houses that you could get on that small uh, lot that was uh, kind of landlocked from the roads. 
I'm just going through some of the houses, uh, Six Jones Circle, uh, the first, and I'm just going to talk about some of the first occupants just to get an idea of who these people were who moved in. Uh, she lived, Dor Dorothea Bartlett uh, was the first occupant of Six Jones Circle. Uh, she, uh, she lived in Hanover before moving to Norwich. Uh, she worked at a dietitian at several hospitals uh, and working for Mary Hitchcock as a director of dietary services from 1949 to 1979. Uh, this could be a... Uh, a reverse plan of what you see uh, there now, the door could be different, the chimney might be different, and uh, there's just slight alterations. Uh, the, the garage is on the right side versus the left side. And as you can see in this house, the garage has been a large, uh, a later date. Uh, very close similarity to the house that is promoted in uh, Fred Brown's ad. Uh, the showing the architecture of Royal Barry Wills. 11 Jones Circle, uh, we talked about that a little bit before. Uh, the first uh, occupants were Wilbert and Barbara Hardy. Uh, Wilbert Hardy was uh, from ha Haverhill, Massachusetts, and he attended Norwich University. He served in the Army during World War II, serving in the European, African, and Middle East campaigns. Uh, was decorated with four bronze stars. And then he, uh, after the war, he worked for Northeastern and Delta Airlines. And then uh, when he came to Norwich, he worked for Kibbe Equipment in White River Junction. And this is uh, one of the, the non-colonial representations in, uh, in Jones Circle, which may be more attributed to the, one of the other architects, uh, Charles Goodman. Uh, 12 Jones Circle, the first occupant was uh, Colonel George Lloyd Outwood and his wife and two daughters. Uh, they came from Westchester, New York. Uh, he was uh, active in the military into 1961. And, uh, and then he moved to Norwich. And then he taught math, science, and algebra, both in Lebanon and Muscoma high schools. And then uh, he went to University of New Hampshire to uh, get a master's degree in education. So we have two returning uh, soldiers so far um, taking advantage of, uh, of these houses. A uh, hipped roof, which uh, we don't see is, is not the predominant roof style in the district. 16 Jones Circle, uh, the Saidas, Joseph and Olive uh, purchased uh, this house. Uh, Sa Joseph Saia, along with his brother Mario, ran the Dartmouth Fruit Company in Hanover. And then they ran the Ye Green, Ye Green Lantern Inn in Hanover as well. Uh, a, somewhat of an anomaly, because you can see in the top right, uh, it has the L. The, it's the, it, it was originally built that way. By looking at the house today, I would have taken a gander that they added the uh, the L coming off of it, but as we can see in the early photograph, it was there right from the beginning. Can't really find a plan that has that option. So it could have been something the, the owners requested or Fred Brown may have request or did while he was uh, there. They talked to the owners. Uh, could have just been sort of an on-site decision or it could have been an option that you could have done in the catalog. It's just not presented in the catalogs as an option. Uh, 18 Jones Circle, Lawrence and Dorothy Levitt were the first owners. Uh, Lawrence uh, Levitt went to Dartmouth College and then he received a master's degree from Columbia University. He taught at St. George's School in Marion, Massachusetts. And then he was the principal of Vermont Academy. And uh, Soon after retiring from Vermont Academy, he uh, he came to Norwich. I think in the case of this house, it's a uh, the 1960 picture on the left has actually been reversed, uh, and it's not. I think that's what happened in this situation. And then 22 Jones Circle, as you can see, this house has many different phases. Uh, the bottom left, the Black and white picture on the left was uh, the first incarnation of the house. 
And then soon thereafter, within the next three years, uh, changes were made again by filling in the garage and adding another room and then adding another garage. And then uh, what we have is the present form of the house. Uh, the first uh, owners were Henry and Constance McGrillis. Henry McGrillis served as the US served with the US Army in Japan, and then he was supervisor of the New Hampshire Department of Education. So that's our third veteran. And then 24 Jones Circle, another house that doesn't sort of fit the, uh, the pattern that we're seeing. Couldn't find this in a catalog. Uh, it's the only two-story house on the street. And, but I did find this newspaper article, uh, which talks about a uh, Corvette home made by National Home. So it was definitely a home that was uh, in their catalog, just not in the catalog that is presently available. Unfortunately, the National Homes Archive uh, is not an archive. They don't have much of uh, information. So sort of have to make do of finding the catalogs and working with what catalogs are available. Uh, the first owners of this house were James and Nina Mueller. Uh, Mueller was uh, at Dartmouth Tuck School uh, as a graduate research assistant. Uh, so we have the uh, couple people associated with uh, Dartmouth in this development. 28 Jones Circle, Dr. Dennis Carlson uh, was the first occupant. He was a teacher at Norwich Congregational Church's church school. And uh, you can see on the top left picture, it has a bay window. So that's not a later replacement. It was just an option that you could do on a house. Uh, perhaps it's the Fair lane that you see here, and then he's added a, a different type of window. 32 Jones Circle, William and Francis Perry were the first occupants. Uh, the Perrys owned Hanover's Indian Bowl restaurant. And so we have two uh, restaurant owners in the, uh, or restaurant in owners living in Jones Circle. Uh, this has a great large picture window that you can see in the black and white picture is original to the house. And you can see in the bottom right that it is definitely an option that you can get with, uh, with the homes. Uh, 34 Jones Circle, another anomaly. I couldn't, this idea of sort of that gable portion facing forward, almost like a little pavilion is another one you can't, I couldn't find in the catalogs, the available catalogs. Uh, I did find this ad showing uh, a variation of the theme. It does have a built-in garage below, but it has sort of that same idea with uh, the gable front portion and the side wing, but with the, uh, the walls of the two portions flush with each other. Uh, Marjorie Wells was the first uh, occupant of this house. Uh, she was the executive director of the Virginia Day Nursery in Virginia, and then she was the director of the Hanover Nursery School. And she was the president of the board of trustees on the community health services in Norwich. And then 37 join Jones Circle, Arthur and Diane Morse were the first residents. Uh, Arthur Morse was a former Marine in World War II and uh, he also attended graduate Dartmouth College. Now all these homes, most of these homes come with these plaques, which uh, were in different uh, portions of the house. Some were in the basement, some were believed to be under the sink. Uh, interesting uh, in the sense that they, uh, they're sort of, they just tell you how to paint the house. Uh, it gives you painting advice. Uh, it does mention cedar shakes. Uh, so not all houses came with cedar shakes. I guess that was an option that you could get. Uh, what to do with, uh, the exterior, what to do with the aluminum. Uh, it does at the bottom basically say, if you got any problems with your product, give us a call, a bit of a warranty. And they also came with serial numbers. And so each house had a, a unique ID. I was really, really, really hoping that I could find the National Homes Archive and they would have had a big book with uh, explaining every single serial number and every single building and then we could have really had a lot of fun in terms of uh, figuring out about each and every house, but unfortunately they did not uh, have one. And just in closing, you know, the, the idea of the prefab home has definitely come a long way from uh, 
from even the national homes. Uh, as you can see in these, these are sort of modern representations of, of prefab homes. And uh, they definitely have moved away from just the simple one story house to these elaborate, uh, elaborate structures. Uh, but I do thank you all for uh, listening to me and uh, I'd be willing to entertain any questions if you have any. Brian. Yes. Yes. Oh, good. All right. Nancy, I was good talking because I still see all these amazing structures on, on your screen. So would it be possible to take that down so we can see? You? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all right. Yeah. Wonderful. Because I, I my head is swimming with ideas and, you know, how wonderful to have a history and, you know, to have you just explain so much. And I would hope that I don't know whether anybody has put anything in the chat. I see maybe one uh, comment there. I don't know whether it's a question, but I would encourage anybody to unmute and just ask ask Brian whatever might be in your mind. Well, I have a question. Whatever happened to 37 Jones Circle? Um, I didn't picture it. No, it, there isn't one. Oh, you mean there isn't one at all? No, no. There, there isn't. Oh, Suzanne, I think may, maybe Brian mis, uh, misidentified it because the very last house that he showed was yeah. yours with all that all that beautiful landscaping. So yeah, but he showed another house afterwards, and he said it was thirty-seven, as I recall. Well, uh, I apologize if I skipped your house. Uh, no, you didn't skip I, my house. You didn't. I. Uh, I uh, I know I've done research on every house and I might have uh, said something wrong or mislabeled it in the presentation, but. No, no, you, you got my house, right? But then after that, you had 34 Jones Circle. and But then after that, there was a 37. I mean, I have no idea what happened to it. It's not there anymore. Oh. I don't, I don't maybe, maybe there wasn't a 37. Because <laughs> that does seem to be an, a, a new number to me too. Um, well, is there a like? Is there an empty lot there? No, I think thirty-seven is uh, the French's house where Jim Schnell lives now. That was the one with the double garage. Yes, okay. and that's the one I believe that belongs uh, to um, Peter French, right? And Correct. he rents he rents that, and you did show that. So, uh, yes, I think you got all 11, Brian. Uh, but it, the good thing is that this has been recorded. And so, and I know I am delighted that I will be able to, you know, review all of this and, and get some all that, you know, some of the wonderful facts in my head <laughs> that, <laughs> that you shared. So thank you. Um, Laura, uh, I don't know, uh, and Connie, because I know you both live in, uh, maybe unfair to ask, uh, in Jones Circle houses as well as Suzanne, but is there anything, How? what is it like living in one? Do you, do, do you find the open space, the living room, the dining room? Is it easy, or the kitchen, is it easy to navigate? Any comments? I'm sorry, I was just having a problem with my setting. This is Laura speaking. Um, uh, no, it has a nice open uh, feel between the living spaces, between the kitchen and the dining room and the living room. Um, uh, so, and we're at 30, 32. So um, that's very nice. Um, I'm realizing we have an original window <laughs> that probably needs to be replaced. <laughs> um, uh I, I that was just very fascinating, Brian. Gosh, I really thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. What's it always was fun about my fun about my work is that uh, you just sort of plunge into a different topic, uh, whatever whatever the topic is. You sort of dive deep into it, and uh, you always learn something new. And this is this was bit this has been a new one for me, so it's been great. So that fervor for historical research, correct? 
Yeah, exactly. And Nancy, Coffee, is, uh, I... Nancy has that fervor as well. She might have more <laughs> fervor than me. I don't think so. Uh, Connie? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, thank you, Brian, very much. It's nice to see um, some of the interesting families that have lived here over the years. And I know it's been a, um, Kathy used to joke, I remember when I first moved here, there were divorcees and <laughs> and widows <laughs> the, on the circle. Um, and uh, which is how I came to John Circle. I was recently divorced and, and uh, so it was a great place for me and my kids. Um, my one of the things that I always have thought we've this house has been a very comfortable house. Um, and I'm amazed that um, you know it, it's been a very comfortable house for us. It works very well. I, you know, um, I'm interested. Some did somebody mention that somebody maybe? Oh, it was Kathy Gerard. I was talking with this afternoon, and the house across the street, which is the one that's being refurbished, um, you know, uh, now, um, is uh, um, we we were wondering whether they were going to get a bulkhead. Our house doesn't have a bulkhead, which is. Um, uh the only the only thing that um i wish it did have um, right. <laughs> yeah we can you can go down in the basement but you but you can't go out except the way you <laughs> can <laughs> and, uh, um <laughs> which is just kind of a funny thing it's interesting what you said about the divorcees uh because you know two of the listed property owners one was dorothea bartlett and the other one was marjorie wells and they they were the only names on the deeds, yeah. And I've just always wondered whether they just were the only ones on the deeds, and maybe the husband wasn't on the deeds, or whether they were single. And uh, yeah. I guess you just corroborated that a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think. It's interesting. Um, we've loved being here. I will be have been here now, uh, and Dick, of course, joining me, um, uh, for nineteen years this month. Okay. So yeah. Uh, it's been a great place. It's so convenient, and um, and now that we're in the historical, <laughs> I grew up in a house that was built in 1707 in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I'll never forget Nancy telling me, Nancy Osgood telling me that we were going to be in the historic district. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> well, I'm about to. Now anything uh, 1975 and older is going to be is considered historic. It's, uh, That's amazing. That all number right. gets harder to deal with. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> nice to see all your faces here. Uh, would anyone else like either have a question for uh, for Brian or uh, any thoughts about uh, the community? I know there, uh, Brian. You probably didn't see the, an article in, in the Norwich Times when when uh, Kathy Gerard reminisced about the happiness of bringing up her family there, and all you know the children playing. And and I would think, Connie, maybe you had the same thing with your family and others with youngsters that it, it is just you know a, a wonderful congenial neighborhood, which is uh, terrific. And I see Laura nodding her head. Yeah, I was just going to say we moved here because um, we had young children and um, we could they could play outside and, um, you know, it wasn't a busy street and my son learned how to ride his bike here and had just such a great time playing with the Gerard grandkids and Oh, and we see a lot of uh, families come in, and this is a great place to teach your kids how to ride, place to ride their bikes. So we see a lot of people come in from Elm Street and from all over that just vans pull up and kids come out and bikes come out and they go around and around the circle, and it's great. So is anyone living with, you know, one of those, a Youngstown kitchen? <laughs> for instance, mm -hmm. 
or you know cabinets that might date from from the mid 50s or or have the you know the interiors been kitchens for instance been renovated and, and thinking about your sturdy plywood walls um you know have have they you know really been a great success we're um, when I first moved here, many of the cabinets, some of the some of the cabinets in the um, kitchen were some of the original ones. They were made out of metal, hmm. <laughs> and hmm. we renovated since then. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so this is David Otto and Mary. Uh, we lived at twenty two Jones Circle, which is the house that is the least recognizable because it has that second story uh, on part of it. And the picture you had didn't show the old basic, any of the old basic house, which was completely intact. The three bedrooms and the bathroom, full bath, was part of the original house. And then they, as you said, Brian, it's very helpful, uh, put addition after addition on there, including a second story over part of it. But it, it was, the downstairs was very functional and usable. The second story included a master suite. So a large bedroom, a washer and dryer, another bath, a full bath, and then a little open study area that was- open. Not little. Well, it's not no, yeah, with an open stairway, so it you could hear from downstairs. And then there was the two car, the garage that was added. You showed, but the, that has become a two car railroad style garage. So you put one car in, then you put the other car in behind it. And I think there's two feet to the lot line on the sides. Mm -hmm. of the but it it was a we loved living on Jones Circle. We'd be back there again, I think, if we held on to that house and moved out. It's a nice okay. community. Anyone else have any sort of questions or thoughts that you would like to contribute? Because it's wonderful to have you reminisce and uh, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, any other thoughts? I see. I don't know whether what's in the chat, but there are a couple of things in the chat. Brian, do you want to check that? Or maybe those are just big rounds of applause for you. Yeah. There's, there's uh, like that. Neither. <laughs> That's all set. Uh, yeah, no, just comments. All right. I was I had one question. Um uh as you drive in to Jones Circle from Elm Street, there's a house on the left and the right. Um, neither of those were, were part of the development, um, especially the one that faces thir 37 on the other side. Um, that house is I, now, I believe it's owned by Catherine Har Harwood. Uh, do you want to answer that, Brian? I mean, I don't have a precise, I mean, they're not, na they're not a national homes home. And um, I've been, I got to look at the house. So I'm going to bring it up right now. If, Nancy, if you have a theory well, to answer. I think that that is where Wilbur Otis Johnson lived. And I believe he was a real estate dealer, but was, but he didn't live in that house. I think his house was raised. And but behind his house, because we had a nice oral history with George Frazier and Bob Parker. Um, and I also ought to say that when you looked at the, the Hardy house and, and Brian told you about that one, uh, Scooter Hardy grew up there and, and spent some of his youth. So if so, those of you who knew who know Scooter, that's where, where he lived. Uh, but getting back to Mr. Johnson, uh, at the back of his house, he had a chicken coop. Yes. And he also had uh, some kind of a barn, and he kept uh, cattle. Uh, and I don't know how many, it couldn't be a, a huge number. But in the summertime, they were pastured elsewhere. And in the winter, uh, he brought them in. So there were, there were 
cows or steer be behind his house. And George Frazier remembers going over uh, and collecting eggs uh, 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 and then the, taking them back to Dan and Witz where they would be sold. So it was really quite a rural section or <laughs> a little bit of, of farming right there at the corner. All right, good. All right. Well, any other questions or thoughts? Because I've, I've Suzanne, you're, Suzanne was saying something, but she's muted. Oh, Suzanne, can you unmute? That would be so, there so we go. Seven is the house that's on the left when you first turned onto the access road. When you turn, like if Jones Circle is a lollipop. Yeah. Then it's and the lollipop is comes off of Elm Street. Right. Yeah. Well, the first house on the left, is that the one that's 37? Oh, okay. I don't know what it is, because that would have an Elm Street address, not a Jones Circle number. No, it's, well, you, well, I don't know where 37 is. The, if the right. answer is yes, that's 37. But that's, oh. that house, I am told, was designed by um, Don Metz, who I don't think was operating <laughs> in those years. So that's probably bogus information about Don Metz. There are two houses on the in the middle there. Yeah. of Jones Circle, and that's the first one. And the other one is up on the other end of that round place. It's right across the street from you, Suzanne. Okay, that's 37. That's not, that's not the house I was talking about, so I'm I'm confused. She's talking about the one. Yeah. Well, we'll all take walking tours tomorrow and go around <laughs> Jones Circle and say, oh, we what tell us where go back and, and review your, you know, Tune in to you know the North Historical Society website and and uh, we look look at your uh, the uh, tape of what you put together, Brian. And thank you so much for that. I think we all feel as though we know so much more than we did before. So maybe given the fact that you've been wonderfully generous with your time, and thank you all for um, signing on. And I look forward to seeing you all. And thank all of you again for you, Brian, in particular, and Sarah, but all of you, Jones Circle, and everybody else who's interested in historic preservation and architectural history. So it's just wonderful. So thank you. Maybe we'll thank, you. thank you, Nancy. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. All right. Brian, thank thank you. You. yeah, it's thank you. historic. All right. Great. <laughs>